Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Office of Research Institutional Review Board Training, Consent Language. I am Tiffany Willoughby, Research Education Programs and Outreach Manager in the Office of Research. I will be your moderator today. Joining me today to deliver the period of instruction is Amanda Boone, Institutional Review Board Director in the Office of Research Integrity and Outreach, and Mary Beth Goodnight, Institutional Review Board Specialist in the Office of Research Integrity and Outreach. Welcome, Amanda and Mary Beth. Thank you, Tiffany. So we are very excited today to talk about the informed consent process. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them into the question and answer section and we will get to those a little bit later. So the learning objectives for today will be to define informed consent, understand when and why informed consent is required, identify different types of consent, learn the consent process, and discover the elements of consent. So what is informed consent? Informed consent is a voluntary agreement to participate in a research study. So all research studies should, um, the participants should understand that it's voluntary. You're not required to participate, even if it is your boss or your, um, your professor, or you know, if you're like a medical student and it's somebody above you. Any of those types of positions should not be coercing anybody to participate. It's all voluntary and you um, should be aware that you can remove that voluntary agreement at any time throughout the process. The goal of the informed consent is to provide the necessary information so an individual can make an informed decision. So if you just tell me a sentence about the research, then I probably don't have all the information that I need. The consent um, should provide everything that I need to know about the study, so benefits, risks, um, procedures, everything about the study to ensure that I can make an informed decision about whether I would like to participate or not. Why is informed consent required? The Belmont Report and the Nuremberg Code highlight the importance of autonomy. So autonomy is being able to make that decision by yourself. So um, I am an adult and I can make the decision on my own about whether I want to participate, but children would need parental consent as well. If you're under 18 years of age, you may not have the ability um, to, to decide if you want to participate in that study. Individuals with diminished um, autonomy could include those with uh, mental capabilities that are not, um, so mental disabilities. So anything, any individuals like that would need somebody else that could provide consent for them um, along with them to ensure that they have their best interests at heart. So um, the Belmont Report principle, the one that's really important is respect. So you want to make sure that you're respecting that individual. You're not trying to get them to participate in the study without providing information to them, or maybe if they don't have that level of autonomy, you would need to require somebody else to be with them um, so that like a legally authorized representative or a parent so they can make those decisions as well. Informed consent is required by federal regulations. When is informed consent required? So informed consent is required for all research part, uh, projects, regardless of study location. So whether you're doing it on campus, at somebody's house, um, at another, another institution, UT Southwest, informed consent is still required is regardless of the study. So whether it is diagnostic, interventional, social and behavioral, whether it is online, in person, doesn't matter if it's a research study, informed consent is required. It's also required regardless of the level of risk or um, level of administrative review. So whether it is a class project, minimal review, expedited review, or full board review, informed consent is required for all of the studies. It's also required prior to an individual's enrollment in a study and prior to undergoing study procedures. So you would need to obtain this before they agree to actually enroll in the study. And you would not want to do any study procedures, um, asking them questions, obtaining information until you have consent. Informed consent must be legally effective and prospectively obtained. So you cannot obtain it after they have already participated in the study. It needs to be obtained beforehand. So there are different types of consent. Traditional consent would be a hard copy document signed by participants in person. 
This is a form. The researchers would provide the participants with that form. They would review it with them. And then if the participant decides they want to complete the study, they would sign the form and the researchers would also sign the form. Participants should also obtain a copy of that signed consent form for their records. It has the researchers' contact information so they can contact them later, RIRB information, and it will include all the information that they might need that they might have forgotten after they leave the study. Parental consent would be signed by a parent or guardian of a child participant. So 17 and under need parental consent. And extra protections are in place for vulnerable populations. So children, um, those with mental disabilities, um, prisoners or vulnerable populations, sometimes they might require um, another level of consent as well. Assent would be um, the way that children provide consent. So it's an agreement from a child or other vulnerable population not able to legally give consent for themselves. Verbal consent is consent that's given verbally, so no signature is recorded. So for some, some expedited review studies, you might obtain verbal consent if the IRB approves a waiver of written consent. Um, it might be that obtaining that signature increases the risk of their participation in the study, so they might approve verbal. It's also verbal is required for minimal review studies. So we don't want to collect signatures if you're doing a minimal review study because that would be the only link between the participant and the study. So you would obtain verbal consent. So web consent, if you're doing online studies, um, there's different forms of web consent. If they're less than minimal risk, so minimal review studies, consent can be given electronically. Participants can click on the I agree button. They should be required to click on that I agree button. That's showing that you, they were required to select that, and that is how you can document consent for those types of studies because no signature is recorded. Studies with minimal risk or more than minimal risk, so expedited or full board. Consent can be obtained electronically, but signatures should still, signature should still be obtained using a UTD approved platform such as REDCap. So REDCap would be, would conduct the consent process similar to the traditional paper forms, but it's all done electronically. You can do it on a computer or um, a phone, a mobile device. They can provide their name in there as well as sign electronically. So then the researchers have documentation of signatures um, and informed consent for those studies. Process of consent. So there's three key features. The first one is disclosing information. So you want to make sure the participants are provided with all the information that they need in order to decide and to make an informed decision if they want to participate in the study. Number two is facilitating the understanding of what has been disclosed. So you want to make sure that you're not just providing all this information and then asking them to sign the form. You want to make sure that you're answering questions, you're asking them questions to ensure that they understand. Some participants might just want to sign the form because they don't understand and they might feel silly asking questions. So you want to make sure that that's a conversation, it's a process, um, and that they have the opportunity to obtain all the information needed to make that decision. The third is promoting voluntariness of the decision. So you want to make sure it's voluntary. The consent form should have language that participation or lack of participation does not affect um, their rights. They can stop participating at any time. If they're UTD students, um, they can choose to participate or not participate, and that doesn't affect their, their grades, their education, their courses. Um, it's a research study, so it should be completely voluntary. So informing potential participants. Informed consent is an ongoing process that starts at recruitment. So you want to keep this in mind when drafting recruitment materials. You want to make sure that they are not coercive. They do not um, provide undue influence. Um, they should provide all the information participants need to decide if they want to contact you to um, potentially participate in the study, but the informed consent process um, should include all of that information as well. Um, this gives them multiple chances to know what information um, they're going to be asked to provide, what they're going to be asked to do. It should be an ongoing process and a discussion. Like I mentioned, it should not be, I just hand you the consent form and walk away and assume if you sign it, you understood. 
process should be repeated throughout the study, especially when multiple sessions are required. So if you have a longitudinal study and maybe you're going to do part, the first part of the study this month and the next part um, in a year, you want to continue with the consent process through them, whether that is having them sign another form, which is usually a great option. Um, if they are going to come back in two weeks, you might not have to have them sign a form then, but you want to discuss it with them and say, you know, nothing has changed. Are you sure you want to continue or something has changed? This is the information you need to be aware of. You want to make sure it's an ongoing process throughout the entire study. So language matters um, in the informed consent process. You want to know your target uh, population and use the language that is understandable to them. So we recommend using um, language that is equivalent to the sixth to eighth grade reading level. You want to make sure it's really simple. Um, you're not using a lot of jargon. You're not using acronyms, um, really large words or terms that don't make sense. Um, so when you say MRI, most people might know that, but you want to explain what the MRI is. Um, if you're going to do an EEG procedure, it should explain that. The language should be really clear. Don't use abbreviations or technical terms. Um, and also, we don't want to place an incentive, um, emphasis on incentives. That could potentially be um, coercive to participants. If you find out as you're going to get paid $50 for a study, you might want to do it and you might not think about the potential risks or how much time it takes. You want to make sure that all the information is provided in an appropriate manner. Recruitment flyers, um, consent forms, any study materials should not place an emphasis on the incentives. So you can't have a flyer that has really little text with the information and then has a big $50 in the center of it because that's coercive. That's catching their attention because maybe they need money. We're going to make sure they want to participate in the study and they have all the information needed to do that. You want to know your participants. So does your participant pool understand English? Do they have limited vision? Um, are they illiterate? Do they have social or cognitive deficits? This is really important to ensure um, that the participants have the all the information that they need and in an appropriate manner. So if you're going to include Spanish speaking individuals, you don't want everything to be in English. You want to make sure that it is translated appropriately into Spanish so that they can have those documents um, in their language. If there's limited vision, what um, special arrangements are you going to make for those individuals? This is all information that the IRB will require. It's really important to think about to ensure that those participants understand what they're being asked to do in the study. If the science doesn't justify exclusion based on one of the items and that exclusion is approved by the IRB, you must be prepared. So if you if you think that you're going to go um, to a location where maybe speaking English is going to be um, unlikely, then you want to be prepared for that and you want to already have those documents approved in Spanish so that you can ensure that those individuals can participate, they're not being excluded from the study, and that you have everything you need to allow them to make that informed decision with the study materials and a language that is appropriate to them. Assessing comprehension. The informed consent process should be a conversation between the investigator and the participant. So like we talked about before, this is not just read this form um, and tell me when you're done. It should be a conversation. Um, you should talk with them throughout the consent form when you're going over it with them. If they have questions, if you think they might have questions, maybe they just look confused making sure that they can really comprehend and understand that information. Using comprehension tool uh, questions as a tool is a great idea. So asking them, can you tell me the purpose of this study? Can you tell me what to do if you want to stop participating in the study? What are the potential risks? Uh, what are the potential benefits? What will you be asked to do? Questions like that can really gauge whether they understand the study or not. You want to avoid situations that may create undue influence. So recruitment methods. If you're a professor for a class, you maybe don't want to recruit in front of your entire class and ask who wants to participate by raising their hands. That could be undue influence. Maybe they raise their hand just because they're scared of not participating. Maybe they think that their grades are going to be affected. Um, compensation, like we talked about, should not be, should not be made, um, should not place an emphasis on that. Timing of the consent and procedures. 
if you are having them sign a consent form and then um, are they doing the procedures right then? Are they doing it later? Or are you going to send it to them for them to look at beforehand? And then maybe when they come in, you'll, you'll go over it with them and sign it. Um, you want to make sure that they're not forced into signing the consent so they can do the procedures right away unless they've had time to actually decide if they want to participate. Location of the consent process as well. So you don't want, you want to make sure it's in a private location. So an office or a lab, it's not in the middle of a waiting room, it's not in, outside um, in a busy location. You want to make sure it's really private because if there are other individuals around, it's likely that they don't want to ask questions because these other individuals might hear and might think it's silly or any type of process like that could um, potentially be um, risky for individuals. So you want to make sure that they have the privacy they need in the location of the consent process. All right, documentation. I think Amanda is going to take over now. So we're going to talk about documentation and when we go, this is a really important part of the whole process. The whole process is important from beginning to the end of the whole informed consent process. Documentation is especially important. And I say that because uh, when I go out and do post monitoring sessions, uh, post monitoring reviews, I go into the laboratories, into the investigator space, and I, you know, have conversations with those investigators. And I look at uh, the forms and all of, of that fun stuff. And one of the things that I see is that this documentation process is kind of a drop. They're doing everything else, but the documentation isn't quite the way that it should be. So the regulations do require the documentation of consent. And what they, what they say is that it needs to be legally effective. So what does that mean? Um, and if you think about uh, like legal documents, so the consent form, we're never going to take anybody to court. We're never going to say, hey, you said you would do this. That is not the, that is not the point of a consent form. However, when you say legally effective, it's good to think about that legal document. So what, what do we need to, to have it be legally effective? Well, that would be um, clear language. That would be um, no, no falsehoods, no lying, no leaving things out. Um, the roles are clearly um, spelled out in that document. They are signed by both parties. So if you have a legal contract, it's not legally effective unless both people, the, both parties sign that contract. And so that's kind of what we want to think about when we think about the informed consent process. There are two signature lines, one for the participant and one for the investigator that went through that process. That's really helpful for the participant when you give them that copy of that consent form, which is required that the participants shall receive a copy of the signed consent form. And they are able to see who actually went through that process with them if they want to reach back out and if they have any questions. Uh, but it also just kind of solidifies it. So you want the participant to sign and you want the investigators to sign. If you're talking about those exempt studies, no signature is required. Um, you just have a consent sheet that then you give to that participant and you do that verbal consent. But when signatures are required, you want to make sure that you are signing it by both parties, that you're dating it, that the dates match each other. And if they don't, just document it. Why, what, what happened? What kind of deviated from that process in this one instance? So the waiver of documentation is, is, is possible. So if you have a project that is not a exempt from the regulations and you want to ask for a waiver. I don't want to have my participants sign the consent form. It's completely okay and allowable if the IRB approves that. In what instances could they approve that? If that participant in some fashion by signing this consent form is going to be adversely affected, if their rights or their welfare is going to be adversely affected, then you can ask for that waiver. Or if you just can't do the study, you can't do the research because. So an example would, would be a study where maybe you're talking to victims of domestic violence and just the nature of being associated with a study about domestic violence puts them at risk to have that violence escalated. Uh, if you're talking to undocumented immigrants, 
they're not going to be comfortable. It, not only does it put them at risk, but they're not going to be comfortable putting their name on a piece of paper that said, I did this research study. So there are options, uh, or there are uh, those studies that this does apply. And um, the IRB would completely be okay with this waiver of, con of, of documentation of consent. You still go through the process, they just don't sign the form. If you want to request this, what I would ask of you, um, and, you and you could request this for any study, but what I would recommend is that you provide a really sound justification. Sometimes we get a request for a waiver of documentation and they the investigator just assumes that we understand and we see the logic or we can, you know, just just understand. And that's not always the case. So provide a justification, argue as soundly as you can, not just one sentence, not just nobody's going to sign the form. Tell us why. So that any reasonable person can look at that justification and say, absolutely, it makes perfect sense. Another thing about the documentation, sometimes studies need to use deception. Sometimes they need to hold back on certain aspects because maybe a participant would answer questions differently or act differently if they knew the true intent or the true nature of the questions. So um, deception is a tool that can be used um, when you're going through a study uh, it can be incorporated in the informed consent form. However, when you're using deception, it's really important to follow up with a debrief. Um, after you've done all the procedures, you follow up with, it's, it's a form that is kind of like the consent form, but it just outlines certain things. The purpose of the study, whether or not that was part of the deception, go ahead and put that on there. If you were leaving things out about the purpose of the study, it's a good thing to say, we told you the purpose was X, but actually it's Y. If the purpose was true to nature on that consent form, just restate it so that they understand that that was true to nature. You want to tell them what it was that you deceived them about, and you want to tell them why it was that you needed to deceive them in a way that, that, that's very logical um, for them to understand. And then also give them that option. Now that you know the true purpose, now that you know X, Y, or Z that we didn't tell you before, do you still want to be part of the study? Um, if they do, they can sign. Uh, if not, then that's okay. And you just delete and destroy that information that they provided for that study. So there are several elements of the consent that is required, and we do have templates that will include all of this information. But it's important to go over each one and to understand why it is that we have this. So the regulations do spell these out very clearly. The first one that is fairly new, and the new regulations actually built this in, is the key information. So why is it that we need the key information? Especially when we're talking about clinical investigations uh, for medical institutions, their consent form, there's a lot going on. They have to really kind of explain every single thing. That consent form could be 30 pages. So a participant, can you imagine how long it's going to take for that process to get to page 20 and figure out, find something out that I don't want to do this. So that key information is a really important thing. It's the first thing on the consent form. What are some of the key items that maybe it's the, the risky things or the things that need to be explained up front that a person uh, might decide that they don't want to do this? So what is, what is that key information, boom, right at the very beginning? We want to talk about the purpose of that study. What is the purpose? The purpose is to understand how mood influences movie choice, something like that. The procedures, every single thing that that person is going to be asked to do, even if it, sound, if, even if it seems benign, list it. So a lot of times uh, a really good way to do it so it's not super confusing is to have bullet points that you're going to be asked to do boom, and just have the bullet points for each, each step of the process, and then um, explain it. As Mary Beth said, if you're doing EEG, don't just say we're going to e e gonna do EEG, because I've never, I've never done it, um, and there's a lot of people that have heard the term, but they don't really understand what's involved with that. It involves putting a cap on, your hair is going to get wet, and we have a place for you to wash your hair if you want, or we don't. So these are the types of things that people are going to, to want to understand. We had a particular study 
that involved uh, investigator was going to weigh participants and take their height. And so the IRB said, put that in the consent form. It wasn't in the consent form, put that in the consent form. The investigator argued, but the IRB said, no, it's important. And so probably a few months, a few months later, the investigator called me up and said, you know, I thought it was silly that I would in include this, but she actually had a invest uh, participant that came and saw that and decided that was what made her decide not to take part of the study because she had a history of eating disorders and she was really uncomfortable with getting on a scale and then getting on a scale in front of people that she didn't know. So it's even the little tiny things that seem benign um, might matter to somebody else. Another section that is required, another element, is the alternatives. Are there alternatives to participation? A lot of times this will be more likely to be relevant for those clinical studies because there are other options if this is a treatment study. We do have some studies here at UT Dallas that provide some sort of treatment or benefit to participants. So what is an alternative? I don't, this is not my only option to get some sort of relief. There's also, if you're offering extra credit, are there alternatives to, to my participation in this research study? What are my options to receive the same extra credit? I'm gonna talk about risks and discomforts. But these are the foreseeable risks. You're not gonna be able to name every single risk in the world. There are some that you can't even you can't even foresee, but the ones that you can, let, let the participant know. And understand that this is more than just physical. It can be psychological or social, uh, economic harm, um, inconvenience, um, boredom could be one. But if these are the things that the participant needs to really know and think about as they're doing this before they decide whether or not they want to, to enroll. So if you're asking people uh, suicide ideation questions, or if you're asking them about trauma they might have been through in the past, they'll need to, they'll want to know this up front, that you're asking questions that relate to depression or suicide ideation, or you're going to ask them to disclose past criminal activity. Stuff like that. There is a benefit section. So what are the benefits? A lot of times for a per particular individual, there are no individual benefits. A lot of the research studies aren't going to benefit individuals, but they should benefit society. They should have some sort of benefit. Otherwise, other, otherwise why are you putting people through these activities and these procedures? So detail these. Please, please do not include compensation in that so benefit is you're going to get $20. That's not a benefit of the study. It should never be included in that benefit section. Um, we don't want that to be seen as something I'm going to get. Time commitment. It's really important to let people know how much time. Is it going to be 10 minutes? Is it going to be four hours? Is it going to be four hours in one setting? Is it going to be four hours over 10 sessions? This is the type of information that's really vital to, under, to include. Contact information, if they have questions when they leave, if they just want to reach out to you. If I've had investigators tell me that participants reached out, they had questions, they had concerns, they, something happened and they weren't comfortable, so they wanted to talk with the PI or the faculty sponsor. And then the IRB contact information as well, just in case they want to reach out and, and talk to us. That should absolutely be included. Uh, if there's payment, what is the payment? What what method are they going to pay, be paid? If you're using a clean card, don't say clean card. What is a clean card? It's a it's just like a Visa or Mastercard uh, debit card type of thing. And then if it is prorated, if you have five sessions, you'll get a total of a hundred dollars split. This is the payment schedule, 2020, um, you know, kind of thing. And then the number of participants. And this is particularly important so that the participant knows the scale of the study. Not only is it good to kind of know how much data, how many people are going to be involved, but if, if you have like a, a raffle, let's say, 
then they will know the scale so that then they know um, the difference between they're giving out three iPads. My chance of winning is one in five or my chance of winning is one in a thousand. So these are the types of, of, of things that are important. One of the most important things I, I think is that the participant understands that their participation is voluntary. They can leave at any time. Like I said, it's not a legal document. Just because they signed and said that they were going to, yes, I'm gonna show up for all four sessions and I'm going to do all of these things that you asked me to do, they can leave at any time um, and it's not a problem. They can withdraw and there's gonna be no effect on them. There's going to be no repercussions if they're a student, their grades aren't gonna be affected. If they're an employee of UT Dallas, they're not going to lose their jobs or not get promotions, that type of thing. If they, if you are recruiting using a, or partnering with a, let's say an organization in the community, and it's, you're recruiting through them or you're doing some sort of partnership and you're utilizing people that kind of use those benefit from being part of that organization. So let's say um, I was partnering with the Girls and Boys Club in the area, and I would want to put a statement in the consent form that says, this study is not affiliated with the Girls and the Boys Club, and your choice to participate will not affect the, the services that you receive from the Girls and Boys Club, that type of thing, so that they really understand that there is no adverse effects of them not. You want to let them know their records, this is the data, what data are you collecting? How are you storing it? Who's gonna access that? If you have collaborators at a different institution, are you going to send de-identified information to somebody else? Uh, do you have funding from the National Science Foundation? If so, they might access the, the records. These are important things to include. If you need to send information to the FDA, include the FDA um, because they might need records of it. These types of things are, are important to include. If you have the, if you're collecting that identifiable private information, it's another section. How are, what are you going to do with that after this study? This is a new uh, requirement from the new regulations. And this really allows investigators to be upfront. So if I'm collecting identifiable private information, let them know that, hey, I'm going to either de-identify it and use it in later studies, or I'm not going to de-identify it, but I want to use it in future studies, that type of thing. So if you're, and that this it goes for biospecimens as well. If you are collecting identifiable biospecimens or identifiable private information. Um, just let them know what you're going to do with that. And then, of course, we live in the world of COVID-19. So if you have in-person, face-to-face uh, -face procedures, you're going to want to have that COVID-19 specific language, which basically says there's added risk just by coming in and doing this. Um, and it could affect not only you, but your family kind of, kind of thing. If you are, this is a section that's not going to be in every single study, but if you are uh, working with special populations or you're doing sensitive material, sensitive topic, you want to disclose that, yes, I'm going to keep everything confidential, but there are some instances where I can't. I have an obligation to report. So if you tell me about child abuse, if you tell me that you're suicidal or that you're going to go out and rob a bank next week, I need to disclose that to somebody. Also, certain medical statuses, such as HIV, if you find out that somebody is COVID positive, uh, COVID-19 positive, then you'll, you'll need to disclose that as well. So there's a lot of studies that involve sensitive topics, and that's disclosed in the consent form, but it's also in important to provide guidance to that. So, you know, we're going to ask you questions about your depression or your suicide uh, ideation or your past criminal activity. It could be disturbing to you. You could find it upsetting. And if so, we really encourage you to discuss that with a trained professional. Um, you want to encourage them to get help if they, if they need help, if they are upset in some way and they don't disclose that to you. 
please go talk to somebody. If it's a UTD student that you're recruiting, please include the student counseling center information, the UTD talk line. If you're talking about suicide ideation, there are specific resources that you could provide. The same with the domestic violence, if you want to include specific information about resources that they can go and use. And then other items to include, there are more things. Basically, whatever will help them decide whether or not they want to do the study. Anything that would give them that extra information. And then, of course, the IRB could require other things. So just know that. And that is pretty much it. So um, does anybody have any questions? Here's our IRB office. Uh, Mary Beth was the presenter earlier. Yesenia Mendez is also in our office, the IRB specialist, and then myself. Um, if you're not sure who to contact, who to reach out to, we all, always have the IRB at utdallas.edu. All three of us access this and somebody will get back to you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, we do have one question in the queue. Can you direct me to the requirement where I'm a mandatory reporter for COVID-19 status? I'm familiar with child abuse, et cetera, but didn't know COVID was part of that. And I'd have to look into that to get the specific place for that, but it is, it is one of those, I believe. So let me find that specific and I can send that. Sounds good, Amanda. And I can definitely put you in contact with the individual who had that question. And it does not look like we have any additional questions in the queue. Amanda and Mary Beth, thank you for offering this training session to our university community. Audience members, if you are interested in any additional training, registration, and so much more can be found at research.utdallas.edu. Thank you.